Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're here for Kotlin versus Kala. So, a raise of hands. Who knows Kotlin? No, oh, I've heard of it. Who has used Kotlin? And, uh, almost the same number of people. So that's good. A uh, few of you have uh, actually seen or used Kotlin. So it probably is new to the rest of you. So let's see what happens. So um, yeah, we do expect you to have a bit of Scala experience. We assume you have. So that's what we use in our uh, presentation. Um, any of you object to this? Any of you object to the uh, uh, object to the assumption that you know Scala? Okay, cool. So let's start. Hello, this is me. I'm Jos Heikop. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I work for Xabia, and I'm also organizer of uh, well, a long time organizer of the Scala user group in Amsterdam, and uh, since a short while also the organizer of the Kotlin user group in Amsterdam. Um, so I'm a generalist. I use whatever it takes to get stuff done. Uh, but my first love was Scala. Uh, but yeah, I do explore other things. So. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Urs Peter. Uh, I call myself software engineer. In various roles, architect, mentor, student, as we all go through all the different life cycles and start over again. <laughs> um, besides that, I'm a passionate uh, trainer. I uh, was one of the first, uh, I had the honor to be one of the first Scala trainers when uh, Lightband at the time started the Scala proposition to train uh, people. And in the meantime, I also uh, train Kotlin. And uh, I work as a consultant, so I come uh, in very different places with a very different uh, level of expertise from juniors, uh, hardcore Java developers that have to make a transition. So um, things like category theory, and uh, the like is not always as easy to sell as on a Scala conference. And uh, yeah, Joost and we, we have, uh, in that sense, both production experience with both the languages. So we dare to say that we can say something more or less significant about uh, what you will encounter when you use both of them. So, your turn. Oh yeah, indeed, it's my turn. So, before we start out, let's uh, quickly walk through some facts about Kotlin that you get a bit more about the picture of it. Um, it's a language introduced by JetBrains in 2011, so it has um, eight, it lags eight years behind Scala. It's named after a island, like Java is named after island, which also indicates that Kotlin, is, to a certain extent, follows the footsteps of Java, which is also named uh, by an island. Until 2016, I think not many people have heard of Kotlin, and, and last year, in 2017, uh, 2017, Google announced it to be the official language for Android, which gave uh, Kotlin a tremendous boost. Since then, it's, uh, the, the adoption uh, curve has exploded. Besides that, major Java frameworks like Spring, also other ones, have announced a full adoption of Kotlin. So you can now use the traditional Java frameworks with full support of Kotlin and also enhancements Kotlin off. Yeah, what is Kotlin? Uh, more or less the same uh, slides you had when uh, we started out with Scala. So it's uh, a language that is fully in trouble with the uh, Java um, ecosystem. It uses, for instance, Gradle as a build, but then all in Kotlin, statically typed. You can all use the, the tools you could also use when you uh, started out with, uh, with Scala. Besides that, it also introduced its own frameworks. For instance, uh, Kotlin test, highly inspired by Scala test, is more or less the same experience as you get when you use uh, Scala test. It also compiles to JavaScript, Kotlin JS, also used there. And it also has uh, its own frameworks, like for instance, Ktor, we'll talk about it a little bit later, what the benefits are of having another framework out there. Who uses it? Yeah, the big ones, the small ones. The question is, for what do they use Kotlin? And this is uh, statistics from July, where you can see that all people that use, uh, that use Kotlin use it still, of course, mainly for Android. Whereas backend and library development is also catching up slowly, steadily. Okay, so in order to give you a good uh, overview of what these two languages have in store, we will show a lot of code samples, where we compare the two to one another. And we will treat more or less all these subjects in the hope that we have covered about 90% of all the features you can get 
and also the paradigms that are incorporated into the language. So then uh, it's for you to take away object orientation. So object orientation, we all know object orientation, right? Uh, something with objects. Some people hate it, some people love it. But yeah, let's compare. So here, we compare a Scala class and a Kotlin class. <laughs> right? Yeah, look at that. It looks pretty much the same, right? So Kotlin learned a lot from other languages. Um, so let's look into this. Here we have a, uh, a, a Scala class which emulate, well, just defines a person which has a method as a uh, operator uh, or operator overload. And we also have the companion object. And uh, here in this companion object we see a factory method which creates a, well, a person for us without us needing to use the keyword uh, new. In Kotlin, we can do pretty much the same. It looks also quite similar. <coughs> Here we have, uh, a, again, a, a class which has uh, constructor arguments, which we also turn into fields. Uh, and we have our uh, method again. And here we can see we can use a simple expression to assign to our method so we don't need any braces. Um, this is a bit more restricted than uh, you can do in, in Scala, but it looks pretty much the same. Here we see the operator again. Uh, here we see a new keyword. Uh, it has an operator keyword, and actually um, it has a, a body which is multi-line and has a return uh, keyword in it. That's what needed as soon as you do multi-expression uh, uh, bodies on a method. And um, with this keyword, we can call uh, override a, a method, which is named plus instead of the symbol. Uh, Kotlin. Um, has constantly chose to only allow you to uh, use operators which are already known and which are named. Uh, so they, they chose a more constrained version because of probably uh, some of the backlash against what Scala does. Um, or maybe what C++ does, who knows. And we can still do uh, like operations on uh, our the, the classes we defined our own. Or, uh, also we have a companion object. Here we explicitly name it, so we see another keyword and it's uh, co-hosted in the class file. So instead of it sort of being a convention like in Scala, here it's explicit that it's, it's, it's like it belongs to the class. <coughs> so let's go to uh, a different uh, set. Here we have uh, a class that extends from another class, <coughs> which, well, we all know. In Kotlin, uh, we can define the same thing, only we need to do something special, like, um, uh, Inheritance is a design choice in Kotlin. It's by default all classes are closed uh, or sealed, as we know that in Scala. Uh, so to be able to do our uh, extending, we actually need to do open and, uh, well, they changed the keyword extends for a colon, which they borrowed from C++, I guess. Uh, yeah, well here we have uh, value classes, and uh, we all know the case class, and we know what it brings, right? We have uh, a lot of stuff like structural comparison, uh, pretty printing, uh, a constructor uh, met uh, method, uh, uh, factory method for construction, and we have the, the copy of uh, stuff. We have a lot more, but these are the common things we do. In Kotlin, it looks pretty much the same, except <coughs> we, we change the name. It, instead of it call being called case, it's called data. And also we need to explicitly <coughs> add the val. There's no implicit assumptions that this thing is going to be a val. You need to always name it, else you get a compiler error. And we can do pretty much the same thing. All the things we expect to be there, if we know Scala, are in Kotlin. There's just this one small change that the pretty print that actually shows sort of named parameters or named uh, members. So. Kotlin borrows a lot from uh, Scala. It looks pretty much the same up, up until this point. Can you see the difference? Let's go to another aspect of programming. Okay, let's look at the functional uh, features Kotlin offers. And uh, I already can tell you now that uh, it will be more or less the same like we just had before with classes. Which might bring you to a certain conclusion that hmm, why did they create Kotlin when it looks like Scala? But later on you'll see that there's, there are some minor divergences coming up. So, um, here we have Scala declaring a function, in this case high order function, with the well-known function syntax, the arrow. In Kotlin, 
it's even hard to see the difference. Can you see it? <laughs> it's the arrow. <laughs> of course, you need to have a mind difference. And coddling also the parentheses around the parameter type are a mandatory version Scala, you can omit it. But okay, I mean, it's just syntax. Uh, when you call functions, you have um, some, yeah, so some details you have to know about. Uh, first of all, what you see here is that a function in Kotlin is always between parentheses. Something you have to know. So whenever you put an argument within parentheses, then it's automatically a function. That's how the compiler recognizes it. When you look carefully, then you see two, all, all of a sudden two parameter blocks, right? So you have the first parameter block uh, with a file, this one here, and the second parameter block becomes the function. This uh, is a kind of com um, convention that when the last argument is a function, then you automatically get the second one as a second, as a second parameter block. Something to know. In Scala, we have the underscore to refer to the argument parts of the function. In Kotlin, it's uh, it, probably stolen from Groovy. And I have to admit, it works better than the underscore. You can use it several times, not only once, like in Scala. Second time, Scala compiler would get confused. So, so far, nothing shocking, I would say, only uh, syn syntactic uh, differences. In Scala, we have the call by name argument you might know of. That's the, the block here, so without a function without the argument, which will only be triggered once uh, the statement is uh, called. In Kotlin, you have more or less the same. It's like a nor argument function, having the braces indicating an argument. And that's quite nice in Scala because the user of the API doesn't even recognize that it's a call by name argument for him, it's just a string. Whereas the computation only takes place when it's really needed. In Kotlin, you get more or less the same, f the same uh, impression from a client perspective. As said, everything between, between the parents, between the curly braces, is a function in Kotlin. And here we simply omit the argument and then we get more or less the same effect. Okay, um, yeah, there are some features that are not really available from a syntactic point of view in Kotlin, which are um, the curring syntax, that you can have multiple parameter blocks, that's not possible. I mean, you can, of course, have a function, it turns a function, it turns a function, it a function. You get curring like that too, but it's more the explicit way of doing uh, curring and not the nicely readable one with different parameter uh, blocks. And also things like partially applied functions are not there. That's the only differences we could find that are not available uh, in Kotlin. It's quite interesting to look how they approached the functions, how they implemented it. In uh, Kotlin, as you've seen, they're first class citizens and implementation is also <laughs> more or less, I guess, highly inspired, not to say stolen, <laughs> from, uh, from Scala. So this would be the Scala function type, which is a trait and the apply method. This is the low-level uh, representation of function in Scala, for which you have all synthetic sugar to make it um, more usable and more uh, user-friendly. That's the counterpart in Kotlin, which, as you can see, is almost identical. We'll talk about traits and interfaces uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, in Kotlin, you don't have a trait, but an interface, the, the one that comes closest to it. So also there, it's the same. You'll see the operator syntax and invoke, which has the same effect like apply in Scala in Kotlin. So you can call it without having an argument. And uh, funny enough, they also go up to 20 arguments. Apparently that's a heuristic that has proven to be universally uh, <laughs> applicable, even though Scala I've heard in 3.0 will uh, step away from this limitation. Okay, um, we see some typing here. Let's quickly look what Kotlin is offering in terms of the type system. Uh, actually, the only addition Kotlin has when you compare it to Java, not Scala, but Java is that it has um, declaration side variants. So in Java, you only have call, uh, use side variants, not on the declaration side itself. And this is what Kotlin adds. So you have in and out, which is, I think, quite, um, quite uh, understandable. In for covariant and out for uh, covariant. And you also have something like type aliases. So, in case you came here and you thought you have also a lot of uh, wild features like you have in Scala when it comes to the type system. And I just uh, um, increased this list based on certain talks I had in this conference. 
uh, this is all not available in Kotlin. So it's what Java more or less offers with generics and a bit a bit variants, and uh, that's it. Okay, let's move to another one. Null safety. Yes. Um, yeah, we all hate null, right? We don't like null pointer exceptions. And well, if you have we're used to Java, you know that they do occur quite often, and we try to solve this. In, op uh, in Scala, we, we try to solve this using a, uh, a type construct. We use option, uh, and this signals that we have something which is optional, but we don't like null. We don't want to use null as the, the fact to signal that this thing is not there. Um, you know, this works quite fine. We're all used to it. Um, let's see what Colin did. Oh, first let's do this. Uh, so here we are going to construct a hierarchy of types. So we're going to use this uh, th this optional field. Can you hear me like that? And um, here you can see that we we create our hotel in a booking, but we need to wrap it in some because we are need to, we need to lift it into the the option uh, type. Uh, to work with this, we need to use uh, combinators like flat map, or we can. Uh, or we can choose to uh, use the, the, the for comprehension. Uh, and this works quite well, uh, though it is visible. If we go to, uh, to Kotlin, they chose a different approach. Here we can see we use a, a question mark. The question mark literally means that type, but nullable. And what that means is that in the, in the small uh, uh, cl uh, type uh, diagram we see above, is that actually, um, the hotel type extends from the, the, the nullable hotel, so it's a subclass. And this is used extensively in Kotlin to uh, signal to the compiler that something is <coughs> nullable or it's not nullable. And, th and this actually sort of creates a mirror type tree for all the types in the, in the language. Uh, on the left side, the, 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 the nullable types, and on the right side, the non-nullable types. Now, if we try to use this, uh, we again, we uh, construct our hotel in a booking, but now um, we don't see the fact that it's uh, optional w the, the, uh, on the construction. It's, it's, well, it's just there. It's, it's assumed and it's checked by the compiler. Uh, if we use it, we, we now see the special operator, which is the normal dot operator we know with a question mark in front of it. And uh, this allows us to do tra a safe traversal over nullable f uh, hierarchies. And uh, well, you might have known this from other languages. Uh, and well, in Kotlin, they chose this route because that makes it easier to interrupt with Java. And also, we see on the, the last one of the question mark operators, the, the so-called Elvis operator, which does well pretty much the same thing as a get or else. Um, in the uh, uh, in the condition check here, we check for uh, for nullability. And this allows uh, Kotlin to do a sort of a smart cast. It casts the the, the, uh, the nullable hotel to its uh, uh, not super type uh, to its child type, <laughs> and, uh, and now we can do normal dot dereference. We don't need to add the, the question mark anymore because the compiler knows it's now no longer nullable. Yes, it, it, the compiler knows as soon as you do a, a if check or another kind of guard, and then it will. Uh, it also works in the in the uh, the switch we're going to explain later. So nullable types. Um, if you come from Scala, they might look awkward to you at first, but then uh, after that, they, they are actually pretty nice to work with. Um, they they seem less verbose, more concise than you using optional and all the combinators you need to compose the, the optional types, and it also makes it much easier to do interrupt with Java. And uh, apparently, it's the most loved feature in Kotlin. All the people uh, who use Kotlin, they say like 80% of them says that they really like Kotlin because of this. So let's go on to the next part. Okay, pattern matching, feature we uh, love in Scala, at least personally I have used it extensively. Here's an example of what a pattern match in Scala more or less can do. Various examples, let's see what Kotlin can offer. And uh, unfortunately that's not that much. The pattern matching uh, functionality in Kotlin is uh, extremely lim limited to an extent that I <coughs> cannot really call it pattern match. So what you can do, first of all you can check on, um, on type, 
like you uh, can do in Scala. And here you also have the smart casting. So you say is int, then p is automatically of type int. So if I continue my statement there, then compiler knows this is an int and can all call all the operations uh, of an int at this particular part in the code. Literals, of course, that shouldn't be that uh, surprising. Um, extraction within a pattern match is not really possible. So uh, advanced uh, matches on sequences and the like is uh, simply not possible. Same here, no cons operate or the like. As said, extraction not possible. Um, of course, you can check on the literals, which is actually the same like we've seen above with Kotlin. It's just in this case, in this case, a pair, which is a tuple in, in the Kotlin that we match on with specific values. But you cannot have a variable uh, that is extracted out of this pair, and then uh, move on with our uh, <coughs> with our programming logic. Um, the optional test would be similar like this one, so the long question mark. They have something like the in, and you can say, okay, uh, my value must be within this collection, must be a collection type. So nothing fancy like in Scala where it's monadic, it's just a collection type. You have to, uh, you have to provide in order to see where the variable is really inside that. Um, when it comes to guard, a more advanced pattern matches with a, a lot of conditions, that's uh, not possible. Um, that's not quite correct. Kotlin offers a different kind of when statement. Uh, the first statement we saw is that the when here takes a p, the, the parameter here. You can also have a when statement that does not take a parameter. Like you see here, when a no parameter. And then you actually get an arbitrary list of uh, conditions, which is more or less an advanced if-else uh, tree you can build up. And there you're, you're able to do things like uh, conditions. On the other hand, the smart cast will not work here which is a bit of pity, of course. <coughs> and of course, you have a default, which uh, shouldn't be very surprising. Um, I said that destruction doesn't work within a when expression. It's an expression, so it returns. Uh, uh, which doesn't imply that destruction is not supported at all in Kotlin. Destruction is supported. What you see here is uh, some Scala code where we do a destructure uh, here. Probably know the syntax. This is a dist um, an, um, destructuring outside of a match expression. And this implies that an unapply method is available, which in terms of case class is automatically generated, so you don't have to write your own, but of course you can write your own. Anybody written unapply? Okay, it's not really well known because normally it's just there in a case class, you don't even know it's there, but you can do it uh, yourself. In Kotlin, uh, you have you can see you have the same, you also can destructure. You do not have to provide the name of the class, just works. They chose a different approach, quite a simple uh, approach, which implies that for data classes, uh, the case class uh, counterpart in the Kotlin, they generate component one till n methods, referring to each argument of the primary constructor. And when you do the structuring, uh, then it checks for the first argument you provide, so name, component one, component two, and I could add my component three, four, five, till 10, whatever I want, and I, I could do even more uh, destructuring. So, less, uh, considerably simple approach, but does its job. So, um, when it comes to pattern matching in Kotlin, I really do not really dare to n use the name pattern matching. There are no partial, uh, partial functions. It's not this beautiful, uh, highly extensible uh, construct you have in Scala. It's not simply not available. So it's more of an advanced switch statement. And we ask ourselves, why did they come up with yeah, such a primitive counterpart where something like pattern matching scale is available? We looked a bit at the language list, a language block list, and uh, it turned out that it apparently was too hard to do for the benefit they thought to get. So maybe they will add it later on. Yes, so composition. Uh, Next to doing inheritance, you also have a different way to, uh, well, inherit behavior. You can do uh, composition. In Scala, we do this using the traits or mix-in. Uh, here we define a ship and a gun, right? And uh, at the bottom, we're trying to create a, gun a commander gunship, and we can mix it in using the key with keyword. Uh, here we can use it then, we have our commander, which we can uh, then call all the methods on, all the behavior that was both in the, the, the class ship and in the, the trade uh, gun. Uh, and um, 
we, we get all the things we expect sort of for, for a fully materialized class. We can uh, call methods on it, we can uh, access properties on it, and we can actually check if it's an instance of. For Kotlin, we can do almost the same thing, uh, given that uh, Kotlin only knows interfaces and doesn't know traits. And uh, so we again uh, try to make our ship, try to make our gun, but then we cannot assign a value to our member because, yeah, you cannot do uh, uh, implementations in an interface. You can only do implementations for methods. So that sort of gets us stuck, right, if we want to do, uh, do the same behavior. But actually, we have a different approach for this in Kotlin. In Kotlin, we can, uh, we can mix in behavior by using delegation. And here, uh, we can see use the by keyword. So we, we claim that we extend from the gun, uh, but then assign a name to it uh, in our parameter list. And then we, it is sort of uh, a member of us, but we also uh, expose its behavior uh, through an adapter uh, pattern where we just proxy through to the, the, the object we have where we're given. And here we can do exactly the same things. We, we can call the method, we can access the member now, though we had to uh, provide it using an extra class we had to define in between. And uh, we can still check for the, the instance of. Yes. Okay, so far I guess uh, not a lot of shocking stuff when you look at Kotlin. Until now you might maybe think, hmm, okay. The next two subjects are more interesting, which uh, I think are more the selling point uh, for Kotlin. In Scala with implicit, and it's a great feature. These are the actually four things you can do with implicit on a very low level, um, uh, low level um, context. You can extend existing classes. Uh, you have uh, implicit parameters, conversions, convert from one type to another, type classes. And of course, all the wizardry we see in the, in the functional programming uh, domain of, of Scala, these key ingredients play an extremely important role. But as you also might know, these are also the features that allow you to shoot in your foot. Especially when you're starting, uh, starting out with Scala, yeah. compile errors you don't understand can kind of scare you off. Might be a reason why Kotlin didn't go that far, but they did something. And what they do, what they added, is extensions. So um, actually, the first bullet we see here in Scala is what they added. And they also added something new, which we will see later on, which is hard to explain in the, in the context of Scala because it's just not there. So how do extensions work? Um, in Scala, they work this way. You might know the syntax: implicit class meaning that you take a certain type, in this case int, and you add additional methods to it. And in order to do that, you declare an implicit class, you would declare the square method, and then all of a sudden you have a square method on a type of int. In Kotlin, extensions uh, are more concise, surprisingly. So what you do is you take a type you want to extend. This also can be a generic, of course. Also a certain type bound it can be. It doesn't have to be a concrete type. We declare the method on it, and then this actually refers to the instance you were extending, which yields more or less the same result. And this sounds like a very simple addition, but it's extremely powerful. It's considerably more powerful than what you might expect when you just see such a slide and just a snippet of code. Why? Um, Kotlin didn't have the ambition, like in Scala, to do a complete rewrite of all the <coughs> low-level classes, like for instance collections, uh, all kind of other uh, I/O APIs, and so on. They won't want to leverage uh, the existing Java ecosystem, realizing that what Java offers is just not really ad adaptable with 2018. So yeah, it has to be better, and they use actually these extensions to make existing code much more uh, usable and appealing to yeah to us developers. So for instance, you have lists, we'll see lists later on, we look at collections, for instance, showing to string like the make string in Scala. They also added additional methods to string itself, like reversed and all, all kind of other ones. They also en greatly enhanced, um, for instance, the IO file API with uh, kind of uh, loans. It's a loan pattern, so that your resource handling is taken care of you. And a uh, quite interesting one is also the let which you can call actually on every type. This is a generic one. 
which is identical to what you think when you look at this statement. The counterpart in Scala, what would this be? Exactly, option, the map on the option type, exactly. And there are more of these kind of, uh, of methods available, but just to give you some uh, general overview. So in case you prefer the more functional approach in Kotlin, it's perfectly possible. You don't have to use if-else uh, statements. Okay, and there is more. And then is, there is this weird thing called function type with receiver. And this is the one that took me at least the, the longest to wrap my head around it, uh, because it's something I haven't seen in Scala's and not other functional languages I haven't seen it. Um, the reason why it's there, it's inspired uh, on the building pattern, builder pattern. In Java, that's a pattern which is quite often used because, yeah, the construction in Scala uh, in, in Java is more limited. So you have builder for everything, but to make builders, there's a tremendous amount of boilerplate. So can we make this better? I think that was the inspiration uh, Kotlin drew from. So we see what we see here is a builder, and then we have this person method, and it takes an argument with a weird signature, right? So you have this person builder, and then we kind of add some sort of anonymous um, function to it. What name does this anonymous function have? The name is the same like the parameter. So the parameter is called create, so by doing that, we get a create function on this person builder for the context of this method. So outside of this method, the person build doesn't have a create method, only in the context of this particular uh, person method. So how can we use it? This is how we would use it. Um, person has curly braces, meaning that it's a function, as we, uh, we saw it before. And in this function, we get access to this, and this, in this case, is the instance of the person build that we created before. When will this function be executed? when create is called. So the execution of this function here is when create is called. And I'm sure, I, 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 can, I assume that for most of you this is kind of confusing, kind of hard to understand why, what it's good for. Um, without further diving into it, what it is possible to do is actually write some decent DSLs with only this simple construct. So you see here is the routing DSL of the Spring framework, which is written with only extension function with a receiver. Which uh, gives us more or less this conclusion. It, it's of course as advanced as, for instance, the ArcHCP DSL, which is a highly advanced, beautiful DSL to use. <laughs> but I don't know if anybody in this room could write something like the ArcHCP DSL. This is, this is kind of a craft itself to write DSLs. Whereas when you know this construct as we've shown before, also, people like him, kind of, maybe, can write such a DSL. Yes. So we already referenced the, 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 the collections approach that uh, Scala chose, but let's see what the differences are. So uh, in Scala, uh, they chose to uh, implement a complete standard library next to the existing Java one, because the Java one wasn't up to par, and the need something needed to be done to make it well, m richer to give the things uh, you th we now expect from a collection to be there. Uh, it offers us uh, constructors like uh, the, the vector, the list, the stream, the map, and the set. <coughs> um, it, you, they, these, uh, these collections are easier to extend than the Java collections are. And uh, also, uh, we had uh, interoperability with the Java collection through uh, implicit. In Kotlin, the, the, because of the different choices they made and, and the goal of having better interoperability, they uh, chose to actually extend the existing library and add all those features that we were missing, when we are, which we are now expecting in uh, the current age. Um, you can see that we have a lot of uh, factory methods which construct uh, lists uh, without actually us needing to think about the, the, the implementation or which, which kind of list is chosen. Um, and it actually defaults to immutable uh, lists. By the, and uh, also, we, it has a lot of methods we are now used to from Scala so that we can uh, do uh, easy operations on our, uh, oh, sorry, on, our, uh, on our collections without our, uh, us needing to write while loops and, and building the stuff ourselves and writing our own if-else constructs. Uh, and even have specialized methods on, on uh, collections like the numeric collections. 
And uh, what they did do in, in Kotlin is they chose to implement um, the, the, the immutable collections by using sort of a facade, or the views as they call it, uh, that just take an uh, immutable list and only expose all the immutable methods on it. So let's compare. Here we, uh, we can construct a list, we can append to it, and uh, well, if you append to it, you get a new one. Uh, we can also do a muta mutable list where you can just add to a list. Uh, we can do ranges and uh, specialized ranges with filters. Uh, we can do advanced uh, methods uh, like the windowed, or w in our case, we probably know it as sliding. Uh, we can convert between different, uh, easily convert between the different type of collections. It's something I really, really miss in uh, Java. And uh, we can also uh, do a concat. Like, have you ever tried doing concat in Java? <laughs> That's why we chose Scala, right? And uh, well, they have the same thing for um, for Kotlin, though they use the limited set of operators available. So now we go into the new parts. Yes, and I uh, personally think that's the most interesting part that makes Kotlin stand out. Um, here's some, uh, some examples with some methods that do simple stuff. Um, as long as things are sequential, it's just a piece of cake, right? So we find a product by name, we get a product, uh, we get its rating, and uh, all is fine and dandy. When things get async, uh, it's get a bit harder. It's also my experience when doing training, especially with people uh, coming from Java, not having all these beautiful concepts in the minds of Scala, then uh, only the concept of future is still something which is hard to grasp. Not for you, but for a lot of people it is. Well, unbelievable, but that's the way. Um, so how does Scala concurrency solve? With APIs, right? So we have future APIs, stream API, and yeah, just saw a fiber of a CEO this morning, and so on, there are different kind of concurrency abstractions that are solved, and they actually force you to um, tie, tie your code closely to this abstraction, which force you to uh, learn all the combinators involved with it. And when you look at this piece of code, yeah, the business intent is kind of lost. Of course, you could use a for expression. Uh, we, we saw some code also uh, this morning where the intent is getting quite uh, readable with four expressions, but there is a tremendous machinery um, um, is kind of necessary to make this possible. A lot of these, uh, these, these type uh, abstractions are there and implicit to make it kind of uh, look like what is not intent they want to express. Um, Kotlin, they took a totally different stance toward concurrency. They probably also saw that this is not really the way it's working for the mainstream. Uh, they want to actually bring Austin program to the mainstream, and they chose for coroutines. And what is a coroutine? A coroutine is a sort of lightweight thread, even more lightweight to thread, can be compared to fiber, sort of, like we've uh, seen this morning. And it allows you to express logic sequentially, whereas it's executed async. So you program sequential, but some magic happens on the hood. And in Kotlin, they chose it to make it a language feature instead of APIs like what Scala does. As it work, uh, here we have a function which is has the keyword suspend, exact same function like before. What does suspend mean? Suspend means that it only can be called within the context of a coroutine. And because it's a function that can, be sus that can be suspended, it means that it can be kind of stopped without blocking a thread. That's what suspension uh, gives you. How do you call it then? First of all, you need to create such a coroutine. How you do that? You have some builders, you need a launch method, and then you pass it some uh, dispatcher, which is always backed by thread pool, kind of identical to the execution context in Scala. And from then on, yeah, you simply do your sequential programming. And yeah, I think uh, this holds true. This is simply readable, not send code. Yes? Um, I'm not sure I got this right. If you want to show a fine product with a spam method, can you call it without executing the method of the or do you have to do it with the You cannot. Okay. It only can be. Yeah. Can you define the concept of listening to the specification in yeah. the yeah. like two packages, which are synchronous with one another? In that sense, that's correct, yeah. 
like you have a future now in Scala, you also have, you always have to deal with future, you also could make another implementation, but in that sense, you have the same approach. Yeah, correct. Um, might be helpful to go a bit deeper. How do codings look like? What does the compile do with it? You have to suspend keyword. And what it actually does, it, it compiles in some sort of callback interface. So a continuation is uh, compiled in here with return type product. And this is how a continuation looks like. It's more or less like a promise in, in Scala. There's some context. And then you have some state pattern which makes sure that once a suspended method receives a result, that the next one is called until the whole, uh, the whole tree is executed. Might think good idea, but how does it interrupt with other existing frameworks? They thought about it. They have an extent, uh, extensive framework how, you, how coroutines can be ported to different kind of concurrency abstractions quite easily. Give you an example. For instance, you have a same interface with completable future. And what you have then when you use this interop library is an await method, and uh, no worries, await does not block. Await simply adds a suspension method to the future, and it's just an extremely simple to implement. This is how I would implement it. You have some helper method, suspend a coroutine, which gives you a handle to the coroutine interface just in before. And then in the when complete, which is identical to incomplete in, uh, in Scala, you simply can uh, resume the continuation with an exception or where with a complete value. And with this approach, you actually can quite easily lift existing concurrency abstractions into the core routine space. These are some examples. Okay, uh, some final words. Uh, it's not new, it's stolen from, uh, from other frameworks. It also supports channels. When you want to communicate with between different show routines, you can use channels. Also, actors are supported, not the extensive ACA stack we have in Scala, but uh, just uh, some construct that keeps some state. It was experimental, but it's, it's going to be final. But apparently, it has proven its, its value. Scala also knows uh, coroutines. There are some libraries doing it, language extensions, but they never really took off. Apparently, yeah, I've already focused to do it in the, in the future way or, or other kind of abstractions. OK, we have uh, five minutes left, so uh, let's run through it. Yes. So, uh, you have interop. Um, the interoperability of uh, Kotlin is very important to them. Um, Scala also has a focus on uh, interop, but let's, let's explore how they differ. Uh, no, not, sorry. Um, so, we only focus on the Kotlin interoperability. And in Kotlin, if you want to add Kotlin to your project, um, Kotlin allows you to create 100% uh, like interoperability with Java. Uh, if you're creating libraries, uh, because from a from the bytecode perspective, it looks exactly like Java code. Um, it and, and therefore it is much easier uh, to interrupt with a library written in Kotlin than it would be in Scala, uh, because in Scala you you, can, you easily expose the the types that are only available in the standard library from uh, from Scala itself. Uh, well, yeah, Kotlin really tries to stay to the Java uh, collections and Java libraries. And also we get features like uh, in bytecode, the members we saw in our uh, data class are actually available through uh, setter and getter methods, which Kotlin just uh, displays to you as being sim simple members. Uh, in the other way around, if you, um, if you would do, uh, if you want to do Kotlin in a project where you already have Java and uh, and, and that Java is idiomatic Java, then um, it converts it to uh, stuff like um, if, if someone added a nullable annotation on it, um, you, it, it acts as an, a non-nullable type, and um, it, it can do exactly the same things it knows from, uh, from when you're just writing Kotlin. And um, Kotlin exposes the same annotations for all the things it knows is are non-nullable. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, the setters here get reversed. Uh, here, we, whenever there are setters and getters available, they just are fields again. And this works well in a mixed project. Right? If you, most projects, they start out being Java and you want to convert. You don't always get a greenfield project. And this really works very well, except this small footnote that Project Lombok might have an issue. Um, so let's look at a, an example and how much effort Kotlin put into being interoperable with Java. Here we see the, the setters and the getters. We're like uh, on the top, we see we just declared a member, but we are from Java. We can do get and set. 
also we have this special annotation which allows us to create factory methods um, which are really static and not uh, defined on some uh, instance of a companion object. Uh, we can declare a checked exceptions to this annotation so that we force the uh, people who uh, are in Java to do their catch. And also uh, we have this annotation which allows us uh, to construct uh, specialized uh, constructors for our default arguments. Because normally Java isn't aware of default arguments, so um, it, it just a uh, two-argument constructor gets generated. It, the, 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 the default arguments are all solved in the compiler, but if we add this annotation, we get two constructors, of one of which has just a single argument and a default parameter. Okay, let's. I can't even not wait. Okay, let's quickly uh, uh, sum up. Time's up. Um, to understand the differences when to use which language, Scala has its focus uh, to, to support a multi-paradigm approach, not only to be yeah, what Kotlin is, option orientation with functions as first-class citizens. Scala goes considerably further, even though, of course, Scala also favors option orientation and functional programming. But Kotlin actually stops with good function support, where Scala goes really into the functional programming world, at least, which is uh, possible. So, in other words, you could say uh, Scala has its paradigm a scalable language. That's also where the name Scala comes from, as you might know. And Kotlin, at least as for now, has as focus a better Java. So this is a different kind of focus. What you get, what you get in Scala is some quite uh, heterogeneous uh, landscape. So we have very different kind of APIs in Scala. You have DSLs, you have um, the functional parts. Also for me, it's not hard to choose which way do I go. Uh, you have interpolation, archives, again, totally different approach, and you have typed X. Before it was the, the, the most type uh, unsafe environment I've ever seen, <laughs> which is kind of uh, funny. Whereas uh, Kotlin is more homogeneous. Of course, it's Android, <coughs> it leverages existing uh, Java frameworks, and it also uh, creates its own. So if we want to, if we want to um, actually summarize it, if your task is to keep a, t a garden tidy, then when you choose for Java, you choose for this tool. And this, 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 this looks like a bit inferior. On the other hand, everybody can use it. You just take it and you, you uh, will uh, loan the mo. No problem, everybody can use it. Kotlin, you get something like this. I mean, it's quite easy to use. Uh, maybe you, get some, you need some instructions, but it took me literally four hours to learn Kotlin. I did, uh, did some um, cones on the side, and within four hours, I had 80% of the language I had, I could use, I could make a project. Of course, there's some advanced stuff, but within four hours, you can do this language. Scala, you get more something like that. So, um, uh, quite interesting machinery where you not only can cut grass, but you can do a lot of other kind of very advanced things. And this is what you see. So you have a lot of language power in the Scala part, which is also um, can be a disadvantage because it can be too powerful, especially when you have environments where people have never heard of functional program. You can go in so many ways, it can work against you. On the other hand, you also can draw a lot of inspiration of it. So it depends, of course, what kind of team you're dealing with. On the other hand, when you look at, uh, at this axis, when you want to make it more uniformity and also very important one, developer scalability, Scala developers are still very hard to find. It's a big issue I, I'm uh, concerned with, whereas Java developers that could migrate to Kotlin is way easier to find than um, to make the transition all the way to Scala. So our stance on it is it uh, when Scala really shines when it's big data, a lot of transactions, when it's really advanced enterprise stuff. But when you kind of need a reliable workhorse just to do your database queries and some JSON transformation and some APIs and security, I think uh, Kotlin in Java does a decent job. That's at least our conclusion, also experience we got uh, in practice. And it actually might be a better choice, therefore, because it's just easier to onboard, easier to start, easier to hand over to the next guy. Okay, I think we've just made it with me. So, um, I think you are first. <laughs> Want the mic? Um, my question about, um, for about um, better Java, uh, isn't uh, another competitor for better Java is uh, Java itself, with uh, now Java 11, I think, which has more and more features uh, to do some things, especially on uh, fun better functions, at least. So, 
So I'm quite opinionated about the, the, the development of Java. I think uh, the additions that were made are not like the things you expect. Like uh, mm -hmm. they added the stream API in eight uh, and the lambdas, but they're not actually language constructs. Like if you know, on call side, and if a lambda looks pretty much like you would expect, but in declaration side, you need to go into all the stuff, uh, which is actually just a low level stuff. Like you need to know what a predicate is, you need to know what a consumer or stuff like that is. And to be able to do functional style, you always need to switch to a stream builder. Um, so then I, I still think that can be done much better. Um, Java 11, I'm not sure apart from the, well, the, the local inference they uh, added, I think in 10. Um, is not going to do f move as fast as Kotlin has done, um, and I think Kotlin actually might, uh, well it reduces your code size by like forty percent or so. I th don't think Java is going to be there anytime soon. And coroutines are also not there. For instance, the Keytor uh, framework we saw fully leverages coroutines, so you write kind of sequential code, but it's all lazy and uh, async. Whereas in Java, in Java 11, even futures, it's still hopeless. Also, with Java programmers, to understand the futures, always in the end dot get or dot join, and then it's blocking again. It's just hopeless. Whereas in coroutine land, uh, it's it's much harder to do it wrong. You still can do it wrong, but it's harder. So I personally don't really think that that uh, Java will catch up, but that's personal. What was your experience with um, uh, Scala developers moving to Kotlin or Kotlin developers moving to Scala? Yeah, um, so I don't really think that Scala developers will move to Kotlin. <laughs> I've also given this talk to several companies and I don't, and when you're mature with it and you have really kind of uh, people have this inspiration and they get the power out of it, I think it's a very low percentage will do that. I more really more think that people who want to get more out of Java, they will move to Kotlin. And I think it's the good thing is that when once they are at Kotlin, I think the step to scale is also much closer. So maybe that's a nice step in between. But this is what I uh, more or less see happening. Well, I, I do think that if you would start a new project, you, you do get to choose, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's all up to the team you have, uh, what choice you make. So you could be a Scala developer starting a new project with a lot of Java developers or Kotlin developers. And then it would be a very good choice, as a, even if you're a Scala developer. So, um, when you explained the interrupt between Java and Kotlin, which which was actually quite impressive, and uh, quite obviously you made it clear, quite a bit more advanced than what we have in Scala. So, just one thing that was a bit weird: is that nullable types. When you go from Java to Kotlin, they are by, by default considered not non-nullable. Does that not cause yeah, problems? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they're considered nullable by default. Yeah. And does that not cause problems? Of course, interoperability always comes with, with a sort of gray area where it's not perfect. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to trick you. I thought it's IntelliJ, uh, JetBrains who wrote it, so I thought I missed something and they, they came up with a really clever solution to prevent null from getting into Kotlin. But it does get into Kotlin. So uh, you always can use the, the question mark on every uh, call you do. So it's like, like wrapping something in an option in Scala, right. like a Scala call, uh, Java call where you get null and then an option null will be none. That's what you also can do in Kotlin. Whereas um, when you do nullable annotations in Java, then you also get automatic nullable types in Kotlin. When you don't do it, then yeah, you, you're stay still in the gray area of... The, yeah, the, we, in this specific case, we're not quite sure whether the type is nullable or not, right? Kotlin yeah. assumes it's not nullable. But Kotlin might be wrong if the developer hasn't been very diligent about annotating its types. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm one of not so many people who uh, work on f uh, Android with Scala, uh, so I wanted to ask uh, about your thoughts about the future of Android, and after uh, Kotlin exploded like that uh, last year, do you think that Kotlin will dominate Android, or will there be like a half and half with Java, and is there, do you think, what is the future of Scala on Android? Yeah, um, well, I think it will be dominated by Kotlin. Like, um, Android is a very hard uh, environment to get into. You need like very tough vendor support to get there. 
and JetBrains is the is the party that's going to do this vendor support. And also Google already uh, actually actively says like we're going to use it as a first class citizen. Um, so yeah, I think Scala has no chance there right now. We need a big backing party to be able to uh, to say it would be equal to Kotlin. Um, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's yeah. also my experience from what I hear around myself. So that uh, also banks, they really tremendously have a big shift moving, uh, going on uh, from moving their Android code base to Kotlin. That's mm. the, the new uh, the yeah, tooling is really like. important. Yeah. Uh, he had a question. Yeah, I just had a, uh, an answer to you actually. When you have a Java type and you don't know if it's nullable or not, when you use it in Kotlin, it's called a platform type. And a platform type is basically a type that Kotlin cannot say if it's nullable or not. It's it's you can you you can do uh, explicitly do uh, two uh, exclamation marks after it, and this means that I will want I'm sure that it's not null. I want to extract it's uh, it's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think we're sort of through the. Yeah, time. maybe I one last question. Can we do more questions? Yeah, okay. You quickly mentioned Kotlin JS in the beginning, so I have to ask: Do you have do you have any experience with the the, the JS ecosystem part of Kotlin and or Scala at all? Unfortunately, not production uh, experience. I only wrote backends in Kotlin, and not with JS. So, uh, what I've heard just was what I heard is that uh, it can be handy to spin up lambdas on uh, AWS because JavaScript starts much quicker than uh, than the Java JVM. So these are use cases I've heard to be used, but that you write really a, a front end in, in uh, Kotlin JS using kind of React or another library. I don't know, but I don't know. <laughs> do you have yeah, any additions? Okay. Maybe after a uh, or, or, or very very last. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there any templating language with Kotlin like we have uh, in Scala with macro and things like shapeless and Magnolia? No. <laughs> yeah. That Extension methods, but that's of course never, never the same like you have with Mac. I've heard that they they are thinking about type classes in Kotlin, but personally, think this is not the way to go because when you want to do things like that, Scala. This is where Scala shines, and when you want to make Kotlin a kind of inferior Scala, why should you? I think that the power with Kotlin is that the boundaries are just lowered; that teams cannot get too wild with it. That's that's an advantage. It can be an advantage. Whereas in Scala you have this boundary, and this can be a very uh, source of inspiration, but it can also be a, a danger. And yeah, in keeping the boundary lower is, I think, what you want in Kotlin. And then you will miss things, that's for sure. But you will have less constructs, less paradigms in your language to solve things. So when you go from one Kotlin approach to another, I think picking you up will be quite easy. You will probably have the same limitations because certain constructs are not there, but you deal with them in a certain way. Whereas in Scala, you can have yeah, su such different code bases, such different approaches, where you can actually relearn a certain way of doing in another project uh, from scratch. That, that's uh, the only thing I can say. Foundation? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>